Hi, it's Lou Brown. I'm back with another of my 101 cash flow accelerators to help you be more successful in your real estate business. In this section, we've been talking about renovations and boy, I tell you what, I've done a bunch of those. I've done whole subdivisions and it's been really interesting to learn about working with contractors and getting them to behave the way you want them to. Oh, behave, as Austin Powers would say. And they won't unless you penalize them. Well, in my contract, it's called Independent Contractor Services Agreement. It's available in volume 11 renovations under streetsmartinvestor.com. One of the things I have is a contract for the contractor. And an important thing to have in there is penalties when they don't complete on time. So typically we go through a list of things that need to be done. I provide that to them. It's a contractor. Uh, it's actually all the scope of works and it depends on which contractor I'm talking to, whether it, it is the general contractor or it's plumbing, heating and air conditioning, electrical, roofing, painting, carpentry, general, each one of those have their own scope of work. And then attached to that scope of work is a terms and conditions or might call it rules of engagement. And one of the things that we will do before we start the renovation and before I pay them any money is we will enter into an independent contractor services agreement. In that agreement, we have agreed to a certain deadline, a certain date, that by all means the property will complete. Now, what happens is there's a penalty after that date. And so there's a daily penalty or a cost for them exceeding the deadline. Well, why is that? You have to understand you have expenses each and every day. You have your cost of funds, you have your insurance, and you have your property taxes, plus you have your opportunity cost. That house hasn't been sold if the contractor's delaying that project. It is an age old situation that people run into dealing with contractors. It's very important that you have a deadline in there and you have a penalty on a per day basis. I've built that into my in independent contractor services agreement. Renovations can absolutely accelerate your profits. However, there are things that you must consider. One of the things that I've laughed about over the years I've learned in doing many, many renovations is that when you're dealing with the contractors, you better have it clear who is going to be responsible for the debris cleanup and removal from the property. We have it built into our independent contractor services agreement to be sure and by all means that they are going to be responsible for that and they will not get their final check until all debris has been not only cleaned up, but removed from the property. And one of the things that I've always learned is that when you sign a contract with the contractor, you better be sure that you say when they're going to get that job done. Not only that, but what makes us think that's going to happen? How many uh, of crew size are they going to have on the project and what times of the day can you expect to see them there? So in my independent contractor services agreement, I've actually built in when they have to be there X number of days per week and during the hours of X and Y to be sure that I can expect to see them. I can drive by at any time and see them and know that the contract is being fulfilled and that my job is going to be done on time. What is typical is that contractors run on to another job and another job and another, another job. They get deposits from a variety of different people and they go start working on all those different projects, tearing things out and getting the, the owner pretty much committed to them to have to finish the project. Well, I've been very careful to make sure that they're going to get on my job, stay on my job, get my job done. One of the things I've learned over the years in this section, we've been covering renovations. 
you better make sure you know the number of hours that they are going to devote to your business. And so therefore in our contract, we actually state the number of hours that they're going to devote. Uh, one of the things when you are first determining whether you're getting a good deal or the right price from the contractor, I always ask them, well, how long do you think that will take? And then as we're going through the contract, you know, how many hours would that be? And how many hours would that be? And how many hours would that be? And then I'll do my own calculations on the number of hours I expect it to take. And I'll do my own calculations on the amount of dollars per hour I would expect to pay for that. Then you can get a better clarity about the amount that you're paying for the contractor and for the contract. Because let's face it, if you've not been in the renovation business, if you don't know how to value a contract, you really don't have many parameters to work from. But if you know the number of hours they're going to spend on something, at least you can have some bookends to work with. The amount that you would normally pay for that project and how long it's going to take, multiply that out. During this section, we call this renovation for success or renovating for success. Let's be sure that we not only enter into a contract with the contractor, but we know exactly what they're going to do with that contract. Now, what I recommend is you actually do your homework. And that means go through the property yourself, not with the contractor. I mean yourself and literally break it down. What do you want done in each room? And what do you want each trade to do in each room? So what I did in my renovation system, volume 11, what I did was actually determine each one of the different trades and then determined what they would do in each room. And I wrote it out so that beside that, you could determine what you wanted done on a particular thing, such as baseboards, such as crown molding, such as doors, windows, etc. All those things are broken down room by room and item by item. So you can simply type in what it is you want done next to that. Now, when we hire the contractor and we get three different bids, each one of the contractors is given exactly the same set of guidelines. So they can't twist it and turn it and make it apples to oranges instead of apples to apples to apples. That's what you really want when determining who you want doing your project and whether you're getting the right price. Where I help you to build your business, grow your business and support you in protecting you from the mistakes that I've made in my business over the years. Always be sure that we get a lien waiver from all the contractors that are working on the project, not just the general contractor. You see the general contractor, can give you a lien waiver, but what if they don't pay the under contractors, the subcontractors that have been working under them? The problem is this, if they've done work on your project and they haven't been paid, they have the right to come in and lien your project. Oh my gosh, what miserable time in your life would happen when you actually have to pay twice for the same work? Yes, pay the general contractor and now have to pay the subcontractor again? That's not too much fun. Don't ever assume that your general contractor is going to pay the subcontractors. Always get a lien waiver from everyone that's working on the project. Now, we divide up our payments into segments so that during that segment, let's say electrical or plumbing, then we're expecting to see a lien waiver from that electrician or that plumber. And if you have any concerns about whether that's legitimate, call them direct and make sure that they said, absolutely, I signed that lien waiver so that you can pay your contractor. Well, one of the things I like to talk about in this segment, we're gonna be talking about lending. When you become the lender, how about let's lend to our tenant? Now, what that means is not lending them money, lending them equity. The property that they're moving into, that they live in, we have a program called the Path to Home Ownership, where we help deserving families, regardless of credit or financial background, to end up with home ownership. And we even teach them and show them how they can do that. We 
do all we can do. We have marketing to attract those kind of people that have significant down payments. In my world, if they have at least 10% down, then we will do owner financing in the form of what's called an agreement for deed. Now, why is that good for you? Well, number one, you shift your business from just real estate, you shift it into the finance world. Well, I say there's a reason they have those tall buildings and marble floors and drive through windows, and it's the miracle of compound interest, my friends, where a $100,000 sale becomes a $500,000 income. And yes, that's absolutely true with what I teach you about owner financing. And what I'm teaching you right now is from our volume 10 owner financing system, where we can both buy with owner financing and we can sell with owner financing. And oh my goodness, the money is incredible. And it really shifts and transforms your business into an income generation machine where you're able to get residual income for the next 40 years. Now, the way I've laid it out for you, I explain it there, but one of the things that's most valuable is when you sell a property to a buyer, there's a thing called capital gains, and the capital gains are payable the next time you pay taxes. It rolls around next year, you gotta pay the capital gain, except when you do owner financing, when you spread that gain out, what, doing what's called an installment sale. So now that installment sale means that you pay on the gain as you receive it whenever that is. So now your gain is spread out now for the next 30, 40, 50 years, depending on the length of time that you do the financing for you. One of the things that we've learned over the years is one of the steps in lending to other people particularly when you're lending to uh, someone who's living in one of your homes, is that certainly you could sell that property to them. You could give them the deed to the property. And then when they don't make the payments on time, you have a problem. And so what can happen is you end up having to go through foreclosure. Well, in some states, that's not such a big deal. In Texas, it's only 21 days. In Georgia, it's only 30 days. But in other states, it can be months on even years to get through the foreclosure process. So what I have you look at and see if it's legal in your state, and I don't know of any states that it's illegal, so you can do it. And there are certain rules that you have to abide by, and we teach you how to do that as well. But in my owner financing volume 10, one of the documents we have in there is something called agreement for deed. So rather than giving someone the deed to the property, we give an agreement for deed. Now it's also known as land contract, contract for deed, bond for deed, all the same thing. Instead of giving them the deed, you give them an agreement to get the deed when they finish paying you off. Yes, they can refinance. They can get a loan from a bank. They can get their deed at any time. It's just that now you have at least a step in the process that you don't have to go through the pain and suffering expense and delay of a protracted foreclosure process, at least in some states. And it gives you the opportunity to now have an agreement to give them the deed at a later date when they do pay you off. We're in this segment, we're talking about lending and whether you're buying, whether you're holding, whether you're selling, when you use an attorney, it should always be your attorney. Now, very often when you're purchasing a property or when you're lending, other people will have in the contract where the closing is going to occur. And if you don't attempt to control that, what can happen is you can be in a world of hurt. First of all, the attorney may not understand the contract and the transaction that you're contemplating. Far better that you have your own team. So in the contract, we always have where the closing is going to be, and it's always our selected attorney. Know that you're gonna have some pushback on that. Don't negotiate that. If you're the one paying the closing costs the under the RESPA rules, which is Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, the one paying the closing costs gets to choose where the closing is going to occur. So 
you, regardless of what the contract says, you get to dictate where that closing is going to occur. It should be up to your closing attorney or title company to duke it out with any other person uh, regarding that contract because of the law itself. One of the things that I've learned over the years, write paperwork, and in that paperwork that you have strong penalties. Now, we call them penalties, but the truth is they're incentives. They're incentives to pay on time. And so in our standard rental agreement, for example, we've built in a housing discount or a payment discount. What happens is because of that discount for timely payment, it causes behavior. That's all we want. We really just want people that pay us on time. And if that means they have to pay somebody else late, well, that's what happens in their world. But if our incentives are strong enough, then they're going to pay us first. And that's what we want. We want to pay, be paid first. Why? Because we have underlying expenses. We may have underlying financings. We have property taxes. We have insurance. We have repairs. We have contractors we have to pay. This is a business. It's a cash flow business. Very critical that you establish your paperwork in the right way and that you get compliance from the folks that are moving in have the buyer pay all closing costs. So it's all related to when you are selling the property, many times the buyer will pay some or all of the closing costs. Now you may be used to when you sell a property, you expect the agent to put in the contract that the seller is now going to have to pay up to 3% of the closing costs. Well, but that's not necessarily true and that is fully negotiable. Know this, when you do the marketing yourself, you control what happens. And if you find your own buyer, then many of these costs can actually go away. And it's one of the reasons that we do our Path to Home Ownership program because our buyers move in, live there for a while before they ultimately buy the property. So that can save you on closing costs at a later date. But if you're selling retail, you can expect to have it built into the real estate agent's contract when you are selling using an agent or an agent is bringing their buyer. So I have different paperwork. I have a separate purchase and sale agreement for when we sell property. I have a separate purchase and sale agreement for when we buy property. And in the contract for when we sell property, it says that the buyer will pay all closing costs to include recording fees and tangibles tax, wood destroying organism report and all kinds of other fees and expenses. Now, again, is that negotiable? Of course it's negotiable and you can agree to pay up to a certain amount. Let's say that you agree to pay up to $500 or a thousand dollars of those closing costs, then that can make you a lot of money in your transaction. One of the ones that is very important for your future is when you can control the closing. Listen, I've learned over my years that when it's my title company or attorney that's closing the transaction, then I am a lot closer to any issues that might be happening around getting that closing done. For example, let's say that something weird popped up in the closing uh, when they inspect the title and it's something that could be easily fixed. But if I don't have a relationship with that title company, it might be something I don't find out for days. It could impact the closing. There could be real issues that I'm not abreast of. So I like to know exactly who's closing the transaction and that they are a member of my team. So in the purchase and sale agreement, it always says that seller will choose closing agent. And in fact, we go ahead and put in there who's going to be closing the transaction the name of the attorney title company that's going to be closing the transaction. So that's important. Put that in your contract. I have this built into our agreement uh, on the selling side. You can learn more about this great, what we call standard purchase and sale agreement for the selling side uh, when you go to streetsmartinvestor.com 
uh, forward slash tools. And you can see all the different tools that we have for helping you to be successful in your real estate business. And one of the things I've learned over the years is that different mortgage brokers have different lenders. And many times if my client is getting their own mortgage broker or lender, they might be turned down for the loan and that cuts me out of a sale. Well, I've discovered that if I go ahead and put in my agreement that that seller has the right to substitute a lender for the buyer if they're turned down for the loan, then I could even substitute myself as the lender if they were turned down. You know, sometimes guidelines, they are honestly over the years, I'm over 40 years in the business of buying, selling and holding property and guidelines fluctuate. They go up and down, they contract, they constrict, they expand. And it's something that you need to be aware of that all mortgage brokers are not created equally and all lenders are not created equally. They have different markets that they sell their loans to. And so I have access to a great thing. We call it our mortgage whiz and our mortgage whiz is in touch with a lot of lenders that others are not in touch with. And also remember that you can substitute yourself as the lender. Perhaps there needs to be a period of time. Perhaps there's a credit blemish and it would take only six to 12, maybe up to 24 months to get their credit straightened out so that they could get a traditional loan. Well, I'm happy to sub substitute myself, particularly when I can save a lot of the cost to sell in a transaction. In the last episode, I was talking about substituting yourself as the lender. And you might ask yourself, how would that work? Well, it's pretty cool stuff because basically you're not lending cash. You're not lending money like a traditional lender would. You are lending equity and it's called a purchase money loan. And that's what would happen if you substitute yourself as the lender. And so one of the things we do in our world, we don't give people the deed to the property, depending on how much down payment they have. Of course, if they've got a sizable down payment, we will give them the deed. But if they've got a limited down payment, say 10%, then we're going to have and give them what we call an agreement for deed. So that's not the deed to the property, that's an agreement for deed. And that's something that can really change your life because now you've still got control of the property. If anything goes wrong, you won't have to go through a traditional foreclosure or it, it's less likely that you would have to go through a traditional foreclosure. You know, I've been in this business for over 40 years. I have seen it all. Hopefully God, I have seen it all. And one of the great things is that I've learned over time that things can be resolved without going to court. So I actually put it into my agreement. I have a standard real estate purchase and sale agreement for the buying as well as the selling of property. And one of the things I've discovered is that we can mediate and we can do arbitration before we actually have to go through a trial in superior court. And so what I suggest is you have a whole clause in your agreement and I've actually already got that in our agreement. And what it says, and they actually initial this paragraph as well, so that it's very, very clear that if there is any dispute of any kind over this agreement, then first, there's going to be negotiation between the parties. And if that can't be resolved, then it's going to go to what's called mediation. And there's mediators around the country that do this for a living. And it's basically, you know, hearing both of you out and then putting one in one room, one in the other room, and then talking privately to each. And they kind of become an arbitrator or a, a mediator rather of disputes and then try to come back together to an agreement that everybody signs off on. And that avoids having to go through the pain and suffering and expense of a court trial in front of a judge. Many delays, many expenses can be avoided with that. Now, the clause goes on to say, if we can't get that resolved, then it's gonna go on to 
binding arbitration. Again, avoiding the expense and delay of going to superior courts. This one is about your future. This one, remember I've been in this business for over 40 years. I've learned a lot about what can go wrong in a transaction as much as what can go right about it. Of course, we do this business so we can make a good profit and a good living for ourselves and our families. And when you are selling property, it's, inevitable that the time that you worked out with the buyer will change. So in other words, there's a date on the contract, you expect that to happen and many times that doesn't happen. So what I suggest is there be a clause in your agreement that says, if it goes past the day that it's supposed to close, then you get paid an additional fee per day for each day that it doesn't close. And that has paid me tens of thousands of dollars over the years, because here's what happens. They might have applied for a loan and the lender, for whatever reason, they can't get their act together. Maybe it's a credit issue. Maybe they're shopping the loan, gonna sell the loan to somebody else, delays the whole process and you pay. Why do I say you pay? Because property taxes, insurance, and interest continue on a daily basis until you finally close. Oh, by the way, let's not forget your opportunity cost because that money that you could have had, maybe you've got another closing lined up or you've got your Mercedes on order and you, you don't have the money to be able to close that transaction. All of that is not good news for the seller. So be sure and have a clause in there that you get paid on a daily basis. What is it? Well, it's really relative to the price of the home. Uh, but generally my, my daily rate is $100, $100 per day for every day that this is extended. How many days do you want to buy? I've got that in my addendum to purchase and sale agreement that's in the selling side. So that's my volume two selling. You can check it out, streetsmartinvestor.com forward slash tools. And this is volume two selling. Today we're talking about one of my favorite topics, and this is selling the property you have to your resident. And it's a concept that's evolved over many years. You know, I started looking at my business and really seeing where I had the pain and the suffering and the expenses and the costs. And I said, where is it that I can evolve my business or how is it that I can evolve my business where I don't have the problems that other people have in their business. And I found out that landlords pretty much are dealing with people with a mindset of tenants. And what happens is landlords get left with a trashed property. They have to come in, they have to clean everything up, get it ready for the next people. It's costing them money on a daily basis while that property is down and out, can't be marketed to the market. And I discovered that there's a whole other way to work with people and that's to give them an opportunity to change their lives. And what evolved over the years is something we call the path to home ownership, where we help deserving families, regardless of credit or financial background, to end up with home ownership. And in fact, we even provide them with a book. It's called Never Pay Rent Again, The Path to Home Ownership. And it gives people the opportunity to really learn more about what their future can look like. We even have, and we market in our local markets, a brochure that has everything and the whole story about how they can end up with home ownership. And one of the things that we're geared towards is when people have enough down payment, then we want to give them the opportunity at home ownership. And so they can grow on our path to home ownership to get to what we call the gold level. And that is owner financing, seller financing. That's when you become the bank for your buyer on something we call the agreement for deed. So we're not giving the people the deed to the property until they pay us off in full. We're giving them an agreement for getting the deed and over the payments, they're paying principal, interest, taxes, 
and insurance, and they're getting the full tax benefits from that. And as soon as they get good enough credit and good enough down payment, then we are giving them the deed to the property. So they could increase their down payment, for example, they could get the deed, they could get better credit, they could get the deed. So the, this is in the situation where you're taking some risk and as a result, you want to be able to protect yourself in taking that risk and that is hanging on to the deed. Now we're not saying that we're going to, you know, uh, hoodoo or hoodwink anybody. We want people to win. We want them to end up with home ownership if at all possible. We just need to protect ourselves along the way because there are situations and reasons that people have less than perfect credit. And we definitely want to give them the deed as soon as they get good enough credit. So hopefully this is of help to you. When you can be the bank, there's amazing benefits and the income that can come from that for a year, two years, five years, or 40 years. Uh, and now you've got a beautiful retirement plan set up for yourself. This one is about having a credibility kit for buyers uh, to explain to buyers who you are, what you do, how you operate, how you can help, how you're different than traditional landlords, how you help people end up with home ownership and some of the services that you provide as a, an affordable housing provider. And that's different than landlords, isn't it? It's you are giving people the opportunity someday to end up with home ownership, whether it's the property that they're in or a different property, you're bringing some services to the table to help them with that. We teach you all of that in becoming a certified affordable housing provider. And one of the things that's definitely a great tool is the buyer presentation kit. It's a really great thing and it goes through the entire process so that people can uh, understand the importance of how you are making a difference in their life. Credibility is key in having a successful business and we have got you covered. Yeah, baby. And one of my favorites is what we're going to talk about right now. It's called work for equity, AKA work for credit. And what happens is that when people come along in our world, we give them the opportunity to do some, all, or none of the repairs to the property. So what happens is instead of going in and doing a full blown renovation, we offer our clients the opportunity to earn credits towards their down payment or move in fee. And as a result of that, then they're able to save money. And more importantly, they're able to choose what they would like to do with the home. That means their colors. You know, probably when you moved into your house, you changed the colors on the walls. Guess what? They want to do exactly the same thing. Why would you care what color they paint the walls if they're getting credit and if they're doing it while paying you rent. Yeah, baby. And sometimes people move in, honestly, their in intentions are good and they don't actually do the work. Well, well, they not only in my world sign an agreement, but they also get a credit in the form of a promissory note. So we go ahead and give them credit. Now they sign a promissory note for the amount they owe if they don't do the work, if they do the work, we satisfy the promissory note, everything's good. Now, understand when you go into this world, work for equity, then there's different disclosures you need to do. There's different paperwork you need to have. So we have a separate kit just for this opportunity. And it's a big one, folks, because I promise you, imagine that you could have a business where you don't have to go in and paint and clean and fix and do all the stuff that other landlords have to do we don't do that we give our client the opportunity they love it it's a great cash flow accelerator keeping money in your pocket right is the same as making money and this is money you don't have to try to get back from when somebody moves in because it's still in your pocket and they love you for it as well. 
this one is selling your property using the auction method. Now, when you auction off property, it's amazing what happens. There's a psychological effect. People get excited. They're bidding against someone else. They want to win. The competitive spirit kicks in and by gosh, they want to win. So they'll, in many cases, offer more than they typically would have if there was no other competitor for that property. So you want to consider doing that. And I've got that in a system called auction profits. And in the profitability of creating an auction, it's a phenomenal way that you can get your property moved. You can get it moved for the price you want. And in fact, reduce a lot of your costs. Now we've got a full method and calendar of what to do and when to do it in terms of doing all the steps in having a successful auction. You want to check that out at streetsmartinvestor.com forward slash tools and check out the different tools that we have for you. And one of them is auction profits. That's our volume 13. I love this segment, we've been talking about selling properties and you know, in my business, I've been in this business for over 40 years. And when I think about the challenges of this business, it has always related to the selling side of the business. How can I get these properties so quickly for the lowest cost? And one of the methods that we came up with is the auction method and think beyond just selling a property and getting a big fat check, but actually selling a property, getting a big fat check and keeping it so that you're getting monthly checks along the way as well. And that's our world. So another concept that I want to share with you is auctioning off, not the price of the home, but the down payment on the home. So you get that competitive spirit going. People start competing against each other, they will bid more than they would have if there was only one player. So you put together an entire marketing strategy around selling that property to the highest bidder, the highest down payment with you being the bank for the buyer. So they don't have to go to the bank. They don't have to qualify for a loan. And this is a powerful method. Now it's covered in my volume 13 auction profits. It's also covered in house monster. That's finding the buyer before you even buy the property. I've got a segment in there on the auction method and giving you all the tools to be able to do it. The signs, the flyers, all the things that we do to generate uh, attention within the neighborhood and online, as well as in the newspaper and other ways that you get your message to the market. To have a successful business, it's a great idea to have a mission. What is your mission in life? Is it just to make money for yourself and your family? Or would you like to make a difference to help others? And along the way in my business, I will tell you there was an evolution when I started to see how I, I was making an impact in other people's lives, not just by landlording and providing them a place to live, but beyond that, giving them a future, giving them an insight into what was possible, helping them, supporting them, providing resources to them to help them end up with home ownership. What a difference that made when I realized that I was actually impacting them and their families and generations to come when those children have children and they see that their parents strived for a better life than the one they had. And I call it doing good while doing well. In fact, I wrote a book, it's called Doing Good While Doing Well. You can get this on my website or you can get it at amazon.com, it's a bestseller. And what I discovered is not only could I do it, but I could show other people how to build a business doing exactly the same thing that I was doing in my local community, becoming a community certified affordable housing provider. What a difference. And the sub headline is how real estate investors provide a service and make a difference. So 
think and consider making a difference in your community, in other people's lives, and having your business impact the future, have you, having your business impact people's lives. So we created a mission and I invite all of my licensees who purchase any part of our system to adopt this mission. And our mission is to transform lives through affordable housing to empower families and individuals to enjoy the American dream of home ownership. And you might as well take American out there and put Canadian dream, New Zealand dream, or any part of the world, right? That anyone who's striving for a better life than the one they've got is typically geared towards home ownership. And that is exactly who you become when you get into our world. You become not only an affordable housing provider, but a certified affordable housing provider. I invite you to learn more about who we are and what we do. Check us out at certifiedaffordablehousingprovider.com. And I would love for you to join us at one of our discovery events to discover more about whether we can impact your life and your family's life, build an amazing business that impacts other people's lives as well. That's my mission. Yeah, baby. Mm -hmm.